This Coin Week podcast is brought to you by PCGS, the standard in the rare coin grading industry. Celebrating 30 years, visit PCGS.com to learn more. In this episode of the Coin Week podcast, we sit down in Baltimore with Coin Week Ancients writer Mike Markowitz. So, Mike, what can we learn from an ancient coin? I think about the uh, line from a famous sonnet by the 19th century uh, British poet John Keats um, called Ode on a Grecian Urn. He had gone to the British Museum uh, to see a very famous um, piece of sculpture, the Portland vase, which was actually a glass vessel, cameo glass, right, that was carved with intricate, beautiful detail. Uh, And uh, he describes it in this 14-line poem. And the last two lines are, when old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man to whom thou sayest, Beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. Right? A beautiful ancient coin, right, tells us something about what it means to be human. You know, because it speaks to us in a universal language. Remember, most people in the ancient world could not read or write, right? So visual symbols, right? The language of iconography, right? Was how they got much of their of their information. Um, just think about something like the the Elgin marbles. Uh, These are these sculptures in the British Museum that used to be around the top edge of the Parthenon, the great temple on top of the Acropolis in Athens. And uh, these were carved in marble in the 5th century BC, uh, which was actually a little bit before the great period of, uh, of co- coin engraving. But when these things were brought from Greece to Great Britain in uh, the 19th century, nobody had ever seen anything like this before. Right? The, um, the coolness, the nobility, the sort of remote, Um, almost abstract, but totally representational uh, look of these people and these horses, because it was a procession of horses, you know, and and riders, Um, that it had had a strong influence on the art of, uh, of, of subsequent generations. And it's why those, these Elgin marbles which otherwise probably, because they were, as far as the Ottoman authorities were concerned, they were old pieces of broken stone. Oh, you want to take them? Sure. Give us some money. Um, Much of the great sculpture of the ancient world wound up being um, pounded into, into, into pebbles and roasted right, in kilns to make um, uh, mortar because limestone is calcium carbonate. When you heat it, you drive off the carbon dioxide and you're left with calcium oxide. Calcium oxide, when you hit it with water, reacts violently and becomes calcium hydroxide, which is lime, which is one of the ingredients for whitewash, for cement, 
for concrete, right, for many other things. And yeah, old broken statues, um, bust them up and we'll feed them into the lime kiln. Uh, I've, I've heard dealers tell me who were offered um, 55 gallon drums full of uh, old uh, ancient silver coins. And the broker said, well, if you don't buy them, we're just going to melt them down. Um, every ancient coin that has survived until this day that we can pick up and hold in our hand is a miracle. Right. When we think of them as commodities, you know, something that's put in a slab and bought and sold, like cheese, uh, it's, it's hard to keep reminding yourself that the survival of this object from the ancient world is a miracle. And for less than the price of, of a piece of electronic equipment, I can own it. In Western culture, for hundreds of years, there's been a romance with the ancient world. Even if you don't know much about it formally, you can still imagine some aspect of it. But what was that world really like? Well, it was a world very much like our own. It was a cruel world. It was a world where um, a high proportion of the people were slaves. Right, who could be bought and sold like pieces of cheese. Uh, it was a world of, above all, it was a world of scarcity. And it's hard for us to understand what it's like to live in a world of scarcity because we live in a world of insane abundance. Right. It was a world where if you didn't stockpile enough food to get through the winter, you were going to be really hungry in the spring until the next crops came up. One of the first things I learned about the ancient economy was that a subsistence farmer is like a man standing up to his chin in water. It only takes very small waves to drown him. Um, if you had a bad crop, if there was an epidemic that came through, if a marauding army came through, you might not make it. Yeah, so the, the ancient world was a very cruel place for a lot of the people that lived in it. But it was also a place of fantastic art, culture, and religion. Absolutely. And it was a world where people had time. It might have taken months for a master artisan to engrave one of those coin dies. Um, I mean, think of that. Even, even at a minimum wage, months and months and months of labor on one small piece of metal adds up to a very high, very high cost. But time was abundant. Uh, and to the elite, to the people who were calling the shots, it made sense to invest months of the labor of a master artist in creating the die for that coin that was going to advertise your city to the world, right? That was something that you took enormous pride in. Uh, it's funny because Athens, which was the, for many centuries of the classical era, the the cultural center of the Mediterranean world, put out undistinguished and really not very attractive coins with uh, very archaic designs for centuries. Because another thing about money is money is conservative. 
People don't like to see changes in their money. Just look at the uh, kind of uh, vituperative debates we've heard about changing the design of the $20 bill, right? which is, you might say, the, uh, the denarius or the, the tetradram of our world. Right, it's the the basic unit of money is that twenty dollar bill, um, and the notion that you're going to take Andrew Jackson off that that portrait and put Harriet Tubman on there, people get very worked up over that because people are skeptical about changes in their money. M money is conservative. Well, the very conservative coinage of Athens had an owl on one side and the goddess Athena on the other side. And as I said, the, th these coins were mass produced in enormous quantities for centuries. Why? Because Athens owned the most important silver mine in the Mediterranean world. Athens did not have to advertise its cultural excellence by producing coins of distinguished beauty. They were simply interested in banging those things out and trading them for the grain they needed to make their daily bread. So I'm going to ask you about three motifs that seem to repeat in ancient coinage. I want to know what you think they mean. They are the shield, vegetal ornament, and gods and goddesses. In Greek warfare, the shield, which was called a hoplon, right, was not just a defensive object, but it was also a weapon. And because you would push or punch with it, right, the shield had a uh, arm grip and a handle on the inside of the curve. And it was a smoothly curved bronze over plywood, typically, or bronze over leather padding over plywood. And everybody standing in the phalanx, right, was protecting the guy next to him with his shield. Um, Victor Davis Hansen, who is a distinguished classical scholar and a very bad political commentator, right, has written brilliantly on the psychology of the hoplite shield wall, right, that this fact that you were protecting the guy next to you with your shield, and depending on the other guy on your other side to protect you with your shield because your right hand, your dominant hand, was holding your spear. That that created a sense of civic solidarity from the time that somebody was old enough to pick up a shield and a spear and play at war, right? Um, so, because the shield in hoplite warfare was so important, it becomes a cultural symbol, right? In the way that, let's say, the horse, right, for horse riding people becomes a, a central cultural symbol, right? So that in every language, the name, the term for knight, a ritter in German means a rider, chevalier, right, caballero, that, all from the word for horse. The person becomes identified with the, the horse, the means of, of, of tra uh, transportation and, and the thing that you'd rely on in combat. Because the calculus of what a knight is changes once he's demounted. Yeah. On the coinage of Thebes, a city that for uh, many years was a rival to Athens, the shield is the only thing that appears on the obverse. No inscription, nothing else, just the shield. And that immediately announces very clearly, okay, this is Thebes. We're the shield guys. 
we'll defend ourselves. Yeah. Um, vegetable or uh, vegetation ornament. Um, the agriculture of the ancient world, of the Mediterranean world, was grain, olives, right, and really not much else. The grain was either wheat or barley. It's also important to realize that they heavily deforested the region. So the Mediterranean of today is a far cry from what it used to look like. It was a greener place. Uh, it was a place where there were still stands of forest. Um, absolutely. But um, the, the ears of grain that appear on many of uh, the um, coins of the classical and Hellenistic period Right, spoke very directly to the people that you know, this is what we rely on for food. And all the things that are connected with the grape and the olive. You know, um, we, we don't see a lot of grape vines, grape leans, or bunches of grapes on classical coins. We do see lots and lots of images of vessels that contained wine. Um, we don't see many olive trees, but we see sprigs of olive leaves or, again, vessels that contained olive oil. If you take uh, out of your pocket an American dime and look at the reverse, there is a collection of symbols that immediately would speak to any person from the ancient world. Because what do we see on the reverse of the current American dime? There's a torch in the middle, fire. On one side, there's a spray of oak leaves. On the other side, there's a spray of olive leaves. That's a, a variety of oak and the olive tree are not native to North America. They have nothing to do with the United States, except our founding fathers were steeped in classical culture, right? They had grown up, right, reading Latin. Many of them could read Greek. Um, Alexander Hamilton could read Hebrew. Um, and this cl the classical imagery, right, these themes we see over and over again, the oak wreath, the spray of olive leaves, appear again and again on classic and even modern American coinage. If you look at the reverse of a regular American quarter, what do you see? You see an eagle with wings spread. And what is that eagle standing on? A bundle of arrows. Bundle of arrows, yeah. These are all very familiar classical images. Right? Money is conservative. It's almost frighteningly conser conservative when we see symbology rooted in the 5th century BC still used symbolically on 21st century American coinage. And of gods and goddesses? There were so many gods and goddesses and divine beings or supernatural creatures in the mythology of the ancient world. Right, we learn about the 12 Olympian gods and goddesses. Zeus, his brother Poseidon, uh, his wife Juno, Athena, um, the goddess of love, Venus or Aphrodite, uh, Hephaestus or Vulcan, the god of metals and blacksmithing and volcanoes. Uh, who is quite uncommon on coins 
ironically. Apollo, the god of music and culture. Very importantly, Dionysus, the god of vines and grapes. Mars, the god of war. And we do, we see all these uh, personifications on ancient coins. But what, what's striking uh, to me is both on classical Greek coins and on Roman coins, right down to the emergence of Christianity as a dominant religion, we see lots and lots of other beings, you know, uh, Nike or Victoria, um, the winged f goddess. Now, actually, for a woman to have feathered wings would be extremely impractical, right? Because she'd have to spend so much time preening her feathers. And unless she had an enormous wingspan, she would never be able to get off to the ground with those things. Where does that come from? What's going on about a woman with wings being the symbol of victory? Uh, actually, I don't know the answer to that question. But from the, the persistence and prevalence of that symbol, the winged woman, right, often who is crowning somebody with a wreath of victory or flying above the chariot that just won the Olympic Games, that symbol had enormous power and resonance for people. I don't know. Maybe victory is fleeting? Yeah, bird girl. <laughs> so do contemporary accounts survive that you're aware of that detail people's opinions of the motifs and coins of the period? Um, generations of numismatists since, heck, the 15th century have meticulously combed through all the surviving classical literature that comes down to us um, from the ancient world, hunting for references to coins and designs of coins. And all the mentions of coins and coin designs and coinage in all of classical literature could probably be uh, stapled together into 12 pages. There really, there's amazingly little. Why do you think that is? Because the people who wrote stuff that survived were writing about philosophy and history and the meaning of life. And they were not actually interested in the grubby details of money, right? Because they were the elite, right? Like the Queen of England, they rarely actually handled cash. You know the joke about when Queen Elizabeth flips a coin, does she say me or tails? Uh, that was something for slaves to take care of, right? They counted the money, they took the bag of money to the market. Uh, whereas we dealt with, with lofty topics. Um, I'm working right now on an article about Marcus Aurelius. And Marcus Aurelius was emperor of Rome from 161 to 180. Okay, 19 years he was emperor. Pretty good run. And of all the emperors of Rome, He's one of the few who speaks to us today in his own voice. There's a book called The Meditation of Marcus Aurelius. He wrote it in Greek because Greek was the language of educated Romans. And he, he actually only titled it to myself. It was his, his diary because he spent the last 10 years of his life campaigning on the Danube frontier against the barbarians. Um, pretty much living in a tent and moving from place to place and fighting, you know, or leading his armies continuously during that period. And he was very much influenced by a school of philosophy called Stoicism, which is that, you know, 
Um, do your duty, right? Don't let external events upset your inner serenity, right? And be nice to people. Um, and hundreds and hundreds of books from the ancient world we only know of from their titles because the text has been lost. The things that survived are the things that the monks copied and recopied across what from the 400s to the 1600 for 1200 years, right? Stuff was copied and recopied and it only survived in monasteries. And bastardized because I'm sure they made mistakes. Well, the, the text of Marcus Aurelius is pretty much intact, right? And it all comes because one ninth century Byzantine manuscript, right, happened to be preserved. And there is a 13th century copy of it in the Vatican Library. But th it, was it was preserved because the monks thought the ideas of this guy Marcus Aurelius are not incompatible with Christianity. All this pagan stuff, uh, we're going to recycle that parchment. So we're in the beginning of the 21st century and probably won't be around to see the end of it. But one thing's for sure, the age of coinage is coming to a close. If not in this century, then soon. Why do you think humanity is better off because of the invention of this tiny, monetary, metallic disc? There's a wonderful blinding glimpse of the obvious in a book called uh, uh, Coinage in the Roman Economy by uh, Kenneth Harrell, a very great scholar and, and historian. And he starts his book by saying, coins were the money of the Roman world. And well, duh, yeah, coins are money, right? Um, and coins may disappear, but it's hard to imagine that money will, because what is money, right? Money is three things. Money is a store of value. You can save it, right? Money is a medium of exchange. You can give people money, and they give you the food you need to eat, or the house you need to live in, or the clothes you need to wear, or any of the countless, you know, the infinite variety of products, goods, and services that we can buy in exchange for money. Store of value, medium of exchange. Oh, and one more thing, standard of value, right? Often the first question when you hear about something is what is it worth? Right. If we can assign something a price, a value, right, we can relate it to all the other things that have prices or values. Uh, and again, generations of numismatists and um, economic historians have devoted enormous effort to try trying to figure out what were the wages and prices in the ancient world, right? What did people earn in exchange for their labor and the things that they needed to buy, what did they cost? And um, there is shockingly little hard information on this, you know, but we can sort of say that the smallest copper coin was the price of the smallest loaf of bread, that the smallest silver coin was a day's wage for a laborer, that the smallest gold coin might have represented the cost of a cow or a pig or a sheep. Um, Ancient coins work just like the medals in the modern Olympic Games. There's gold, there's silver, there's bronze. 
Let's talk about gold coinage. Right? Gold has been precious to people for thousands of years before anybody ever had the idea of making a coin. Right? The Egyptians had for millennia, for thousands of years, a sophisticated society with a complex economy and no coinage, really. Does that mean there was no money? No, of course not. Egyptians were paid right in loaves of bread and jars of beer. Those were the medium of exchange, the standard of value. Of course, a jar of beer and a loaf of bread are not a very good store of value because they're going to go bad, right? especially because Right? No, nobody had really invented the cork for Egypt. But are they a good standard of value also because there's a big difference between a tasty loaf of bread and a sawmill loaf of bread or a watered down beer and a delicious beer? I think it was a pretty standardized product. <laughs> it was a pretty standardized product. Um, so yeah, there, you, you don't need coins to have money, right? Uh, you don't need banknotes to have money. We're finding, right, that um, your cell phone, right, can be the place where you store your value and execute your mean media of exchange, right? Um, I'm struck by the fact that young people will not bend down and pick up a penny in the street. Whereas my generation, you know, even though our, even though our muscles might be getting stiff, we'll pr pretty much still bend down and pick up a penny in the street. But um, it, it won't be long before we have a generation that will not necessarily see coins as money. Because for one thing, because they're worth so little. You know, when it costs more than a penny to make a penny, right? I believe it still costs more than a nickel to make a nickel. Um, the writing is clearly on the wall for small change. Most countries are giving up their smallest denominations of coinage. Uh, Canada no longer produces a one cent coin, for example. Uh, New Zealand gave up both the one cent and the five cent coin. Uh, uh, Sweden is talking about doing away with coins entirely. And um, so, uh, yeah, once that connection between the idea of money and the physical artifact of a coin is no longer a living concept. I'm not sure what that's going to mean for coin collectors. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your friends and you can download all 45 episodes of the Coin Week podcast for free from the iTunes store. For Coin Week, I'm editor Charles Morgan. Until next time, happy collecting.